All right, now we're going to use our animation skills and also quite a bit more to make our first complex game and that's going to be tic-tac-toe. If you've never played it before, tic-tac-toe or noughts and crosses is a two-player game and you have a three by three grid like that and the first player usually plays noughts so when you tap in a square a nought appears. Second player will then play crosses and the first player noughts again and the aim of the game is to get three in a row. So once one player gets three, then a nice message appears on our game and the user has the option to play again, which then resets the board and starts everything from scratch. All right, so this is probably the most complicated game we've made so far. I'm gonna give you a few minor hints to get you going. If you really don't want any hints, then just pause the video right now and get started. But I'd recommend is setting these images up as buttons, which are initially empty. And then when they're tapped on, a zero or a cross appears. In order to do that, you'll need to use tags, which we saw in our first run through of Xcode, but we haven't used since. So try and work out how you might use tags to get your program to save which positions are already filled and what they're filled with. You'll also need to add more than one button, in fact, all nine of these buttons, to the same IB action. Finally, you'll need to store the game state somehow so that, as I say, you know the positions of the noughts and crosses on the board. And you'll need to find a way of storing and checking against all the winning combinations, which are the horizontal lines, vertical lines, and the two diagonals. One final thing before you start to make your life a little bit easier, I've put together the images that I've used to stop you having to find suitable noughts and crosses images. And you can get those at iosdevelopercourse.com forward slash tick tac toe images dot zip. So if you go to that URL, that will just download to your desktop and you'll find the images that you need in there. So there's a lot of fun stuff in there. As always, do as much as you can by yourself, but don't feel it's in any way a failure if you ended up watching the video as well. Best of luck, go for it. All right, I hope that went well. I'm gonna start, of course, by creating a new project. So I'll call this tic-tac-toe. Usual settings, saved in the desktop. All right, and we'll start in main storyboard. And let's begin by setting up our images. So over to Finder, there's my tic-tac-toe images zip file. So I'll just bring those out and copy them into the app. And let's start then by bringing in the board image. Via an image view. So I'm going to center it in the screen like that then. And then We'll drag it up and then we'll just stretch it up and change the mode to aspect fit. Okay. As I mentioned, I'm not going to be worried about auto layout here. I'll just get everything working for iPhone 6 screen size portrait orientation. So next I'm going to bring in a button. This button's going to be centered. And this is actually going to be my noughts and crosses. So we're going to set the image to let's start with a nought. And then get everything the right size. 
that looks pretty good. So now I'm going to copy and paste to get a new zero in there. Let's bring that one up. And then I'll just keep pasting. To get all of our zeros displaying nicely. There we go. Let's keep on adding them. Nearly there. Okay. All right. Now to try and get these laying out nicely, we'll have that central one centered horizontally and vertically in the container. And we'll set the width and height as well. There we go. And then just to check, so that <laughs> the zero appears nicely, everything else doesn't, but that's okay. Let's sort out the background image. So if we set the width and the height, then we should now have, yep, one zero in the right place and the background as well. And then let's center this one horizontally, and then we'll set the lower spacing and the width and height. And that one should now be in the right place. Let's have a look. Yep. Excellent. So this one, actually, let's do this one first. So we'll center horizontally, and then we'll set the upper constraint and width and height. Again, let's have a look. Yep. Now we've got three in the right place. Let's do this one. So we'll center it vertically and we'll set the left constraint and width and height. There we go. And here we'll set the right constraint, width and height, and center vertically. Just have a look. Excellent. Now it's just the corner ones to go. And for those, we'll set, so we've got the right, bottom, width, and height. Then we've got the left, bottom, width, and height. Almost there. Top, left, width, height. And finally, top, right, width, height. So now we should have something that looks pretty good, both orientations there. And it should look pretty good on the bigger screen sizes as well, although it will be pretty small on the iPad. But as I mentioned, it won't look good on the smaller screen sizes. There we go. So this would need to be an iPhone 6 and above game. All right. So now we need to set these buttons to do something when they're tapped. So what we want to avoid is creating separate IB actions for each of these buttons, because then we'd have nine different IB actions all doing a very similar thing. So what we can do is control drag from one of the buttons and create an action there. And for now, I'm just going to have a very simple
print button pressed. And then we just drag or control drag each of the other buttons to connect them to that IB action. And then all of the buttons will be connected to that single IB action, which means that we won't have to write the code out for controlling a button press nine times. You might be wondering how we'll know which button is pressed, but don't worry, we'll answer that question soon enough. Just while that's compiling, I'm just going to select all of the buttons and remove the background image. Because of course we want the board to be blank initially and only bring in the buttons when they're tapped. And here we go, so let's tap. There we go, you can see all of the buttons are activating the button pressed method there. Brilliant. So the big question is how will we know which button has been pressed? Well, the answer is in this sender variable there, which we have actually used earlier on, but not in combination with tags. And this was my hint to you at the beginning that we did see right at the beginning of the course that each user interface element can have a tag, which is essentially a number that we can use to identify it. So what I'm going to do is start at number one and give each of these a tag. So one, two, three, going across the top, four, five, and six going down the middle. And then seven, eight, and nine going across the bottom. Notice I started at one because the default tag is zero. So if I start at one, then that will make it easier to know essentially if the button has a non-zero tag, then it must be one of these nine buttons. You can start at zero, but it just makes it, I think, a little bit more distinctive if each of the buttons has a non-zero tag. Then we can get the tag using the sender variable dot tag. So let's now see that in action. We should find that we get a number which is the corresponding buttons tag. Here we go. So let's give it a try. There we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Wonderful. So now we've only got a single method to deal with, but using the senders tag, we can identify which one that is. Brilliant. So let's get started with what we need to do when one of the buttons is pressed. So the first thing I will change is to change the image on the button. And we do that using sender to once again refer to the button that was tapped dot set image. And we need to set the image to a UI image. And we're going to set the UI image from a file name, just as we did with Lisa Simpson at the beginning of this section. So for now, let's set it to naught.png. And we do also need to specify the state that we're setting that for. And remember, we use the empty array to specify the normal or default state. All right, so that should now set the image of the button that was tapped to the naught image, which is a start. Obviously, we then need to have a way of working out whose go it is and then setting the naught or across appropriately. So let's have a look. There we go. 
So we can now fill up the board with noughts and we're still getting our numbers down there. Fantastic. All right, so let's now have a variable which keeps track of whose go it is. So I'm going to call this variable active player and I'm going to initially set it to one. And I'm going to give a little comment to myself. One is noughts, two is crosses. We could use true or false or some other way of being track of the active player, but using one or two has some advantages later on. And we'll see in a moment what they are. So now when the button is pressed, we'll look to see if active player is one. So if that's the case, then we want to make the image a naught and we want to set the active player to be two. And if that's not the case, we want to do something pretty similar, but this time we want to set the image to cross.png and set the active player to one. So hopefully that makes sense. If it's noughts playing, then we'll set the image to a naught and make it crosses playing. And if it's crosses playing, we'll send the image to a cross and set it back to noughts go next. So let's see this in action. Here we go. So I'll start top left. We've got a naught and then a cross and a naught and a cross. Wonderful. So everything's working so far, but of course we've got a lot of problems with our game as yet. One of them being that crosses can overtake noughts if they want and vice versa. There we go. And we don't want that. So the next thing we're going to fix is we're going to keep track of the game state. And the way we'll do that is by having an array called game state. And this is going to be an array of nine numbers. Initially, they'll all be zeros. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So zero represents empty. One is going to be noughts and two is going to be crosses. So this is where we see having one and two is quite useful here. Having zero and one wouldn't help us to distinguish an empty slot from a full one. Although there are some fairly easy ways around that. So you could definitely do it the other way, but I think this is quite neat. All right. So when the button is pressed, now we're going to create a variable called active position. And this is going to be equal to the sender tag minus one. And this is the slight disadvantage of using one to nine as the numbers, because of course, in an array, everything works in terms of zero to what will for us be eight, but we can reasonably easily get rid of that by minusing one from our tag. So now we can check first off if game state active position is equal to zero, then we'll do all of this. Otherwise, we won't do anything because it's just someone tapping on a spot that already has been filled. So let's just check and make sure that works. And yes, because we're redefining active position each time the button press method is called, we can probably use let rather than var there. Of course, before we test that out, we'll need to actually update the array when one of the empty positions is tapped. 
So we'll set game state active position. And in fact, rather than doing it in the if statement, we can set we can just set it equal to active player. And then it will be set to either one or two, depending on who the active player at the time is. So now we should only be able to make a naught or a cross appear if there's not already one there. Okay, here we go. So we've got a naught. If I try and change it into a cross, nothing happens. I can put a cross in the middle there, but if I try and change it to a naught, nothing happens. Wonderful. So now it's actually fully playable as a game. The only thing really missing is some kind of acknowledgement when the game is over and of course the option to start again. So it's not very satisfying to get to this point of the game and then have to restart the app when the game is done. So, as well as game state, we're going to need to have a variable to store the winning combinations because we need to know when somebody has won. So let's have a variable called willing, winning combinations. We can actually store these quite simply. You would have thought it would be quite complicated, but it's actually quite straightforward. So if this is position 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, then the first winning combination is this horizontal row at the top, which is position 0, 1, and 2. So we can store that as an array within winning combinations like so, 0, 1, and 2. Next, we'll look at the second horizontal, which is 3, 4, 5. So we'll store that as our second combination. And next, the third combination, 6, 7, 8. Next, we'll do the verticals. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 1, 4, 7. Then the next one along, we just need to add one to each of those. So 2, 5, 8. And then add one to each of those again. 3, 6. And something's actually gone wrong there. Because we shouldn't get to 9. Ah, yes. I started at 1 rather than 0. So that should be 0, 3, 6. That should be 1, 4, 7. And that should be 2, 5, 8. Great, so that's the horizontals and the verticals. So all that's left is the two diagonals. So that's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So 0, 4, 8. And the other one, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So 2, 4, 6. Okay, so now we need to check after each go to see whether someone has got, say, a 1 in those three positions, or those three positions, or those three positions. So we're going to loop through winning combinations, which we'll do using a for loop. So for combination in winning combinations. And we want to check for each combination. Firstly, we want to check to see if combination 0 is not equal to 0. And we could use 0, 1, or 2 there. It doesn't actually matter. But I'll use 0 because we need all of them to be non-zero. And then what we want to do is check the game state of each of the positions. So I'm going to start by checking to see if game state combination 0 is not zero. 
So remember, combination zero is the first item in the combination. So here that would be a zero, here that's three, here that's six. So we're looking for the state of that particular position and checking that it's not zero. Because if it's zero, then there's definitely not a win here. Because what we're looking for is for where the game state of all three combinations is either 111 or 222 to show that either noughts and cross noughts of one or crosses of one. So if the first item is not zero, that's a start. And then we'll check to see if the first item is equal to the second. So we're looking for game state combination zero again, and we need that to be equal to game state combination one. So that would mean that someone's got two out of three of these three parts of the winning combination. So let's check for the other two. So we're now checking to see if game state combination one is equal to game state combination two. So if all these are true, then that would mean that the first one's not zero, the first one's equal to the second, and the second's equal to the third. So combined, we must have either a 111 or a 222, which gives us a win. So I'll just put a quick comment in there. So we need to do two things here. We need to tell the users of the game that we have a winner and give them an option to play again. And we have to stop the game so that they can't carry on playing. So let's do the second of those two first. And we'll have a variable called active game, which is initially true. And then here we'll check not only for game state active position being zero, but also we'll check for an active game. And here We'll set active game to be false. And we'll also for now just print the identity of the winner, which I'll keep as game state combination zero. So let's just check. We've done a lot of a lot of work there, and we could easily have made a mistake of some sort. So let's check and see if that works. And if it does, then all that remains is for us to create labels to congratulate the winner and a button to give the users the option of playing again. So here we go. Let's give Noughts the winner. And there we go. So you can see we've got a one there, which indicates that Noughts has won. And if I try and carry on playing, it doesn't let me. Super. Okay, so now back over to main storyboard. Let's bring in a label to celebrate our winner. So we'll center it and I'll change the text temporarily to noughts. has one. And let's do a little bit of formatting here. We'll set it to a nice bright green. And we'll make it pretty big. There we go. And we'll just need to stretch it out a bit vertically. There it is. 
Okay, and I'll set the constraints. Actually, we can make that horizontally and vertically centered. And it's going to want us to set the width and height as well. Lovely. And then we'll just need our button. Pop it there for play again. Okay, not the most beautiful symbols, but they get the job done. You can always make yours look much prettier than mine if you're so inclined. So then we need to bring in IB actions for our winner label. Oh, sorry, IB outlets for our winner label and our play again button. The outlets there will enable us to animate them in. And we'll also have an action because we'll need to do something when the user wants to play again which of course they will. Okay, so we need to get rid of those labels before the game shows. We can do that in the view did load method. And, and I'm gonna do two things here. One is to set them both to hidden like that. And same with the play again button so that they can't be seen. And I'm also going to position them outside of the screen. And then we'll set the winner label to have a center to the left of the screen as we did before. So we want a CG core graphics point and this is going to have an x coordinate of the current center center x minus 500 and y will be the same as it was and similarly with the play again button This is going to be CG point and X is going to be play again button dot center dot X minus 500 and then play again button dot center dot Y unchanged. And then we're going to bring them back in here, but just before we bring them back, we need to set the correct winner to the winner label. So currently it's noughts has one, but we need to make that appropriate to whoever has one. So if game state combination zero, remember that's the number of the winner. So if that's equal to one, then we'll set the winner label text to be noughts has one and if it's not we'll set it to winner label dot text is crosses has one I'm still not sure whether that should be has or have but I'll leave it at has and you can correct it in your app if you'd like all right and then we just bring them in so UI view dot animate with duration. We'll have a duration of one second. And we need to set the winner label dot center to be equal to core graphics point with an X coordinate 
of winner label dot center dot x plus 500 just as we did before and a y coordinate of winner label dot center dot y and similarly play again button dot center is going to be a cg point with an x coordinate Play again, button.center.x plus 500. And Y, play again, button.center.y. And can you remember what I've forgotten? I've forgotten all myself. So we're inside a closure here, happening outside the main thread. So we need to use self to make it clear that we're referring to something outside of the closure and specifically in the view controller. Okay, so we'll just play that and check. We should now find that we don't see those labels when the game starts up, but when somebody wins, it puts the appropriate winner name on the winner label and then both labels or the label and the button then zoom into position in a reasonably stylish way. And finally, we'll need to set both winner label and play again button to not be hidden. Okay. So we should now find that when the game is over, not only does the game stop play, but a nice winner label zooms in from the left and we see the correct identity of the winner. And we have a button appearing there from the left as well, giving them the chance to play again. Although of course, that doesn't actually do anything quite yet. So our last challenge after this will be to make the play again button, reset the board and start everything off. Okay, here we go. We're gonna let crosses win this time, just for a bit of variety. And here we go. There's our final cross and excellent. So that's come in very nicely and we can tap play again, but nothing will happen quite yet. Brilliant. So I'm happy with that. You might want to change the background color of that just to make it a little bit clearer on top of the crosses, but I'll leave that up to you. So we've already got a play again method here. So let's just work out what we need to do at that point. We need to reset all of the game variables. So we need to essentially do all of these, but we're not creating the variables anymore just updating them. So we're resetting the game to be active again. We're setting the active player back to one and we're setting the game state back to zero. Next, we need to loop through all of the buttons and get rid of their images. And there's a nifty way to do that. We can create a variable, say called button, which is gonna have a type of UI button. And then we're gonna loop through all of the views, which is the UI elements, with a certain tag. So we're gonna do a for loop for i in, and we're gonna go from one to 10. Remember that means one less than 10. And then we're going to set our button equal to, from within the view, we're going to look for a view with a tag. And the tag that we're looking for is going to be I. And this is where I was saying it's useful to have, if you're going to set the tag as something specific, set it, set it all 
to something non-zero. Otherwise, we'd have to go through all the other views and set the tags to something non-zero so we wouldn't confuse what the zero tag is. And then we want to cast that to a UI button. And we can either force cast it, which I'm pretty confident we can do. But otherwise, we could use an if statement instead, just in case. And in that case, actually, we'd need to define button within the for loop, which is probably a slightly neater way. If there was any chance that there was a view with a tag which wasn't one of our buttons, we wouldn't get a crash here. And we should make that an optional casting. The reason, by the way, we need to cast that is because this is going to return a general view, which is any kind of UI element. And we want to use some button specific features. So we're going to need to cast it to a button. And specifically, the button specific features that we're going to use are, well, there's only one, set image. And we want to set the image to nil. So get rid of all the images for the normal state, which we now know is just an empty array. Finally, then, all that remains is to take our labels, make them disappear, and move them off the screen. So we can just copy and paste that code because it's exactly the same. All right, so barring disastrous mistakes, this game should now work completely as intended, and we should be able to play a proper game. And once we've discovered a winner, we should be able to press the play again button and be able to restart and play the whole thing again and again. So here we go. Let's test out a different winning strategy and we'll let zeros win this time. Make sure everything works. Final zero. There we go. Noughts has one. Excellent. Play again. And there we go. We can now start the whole thing again and it all works great. Wonderful. So I hope you enjoyed making that one. And as always, I hope you managed to do a fair bit of it yourself. Although there were a few quite tricky bits there with the tags and also some fairly complex arrays to be working with. As always though, we're not going to be hanging around on this topic for long. And in the next video, we're going to be moving on to see how we can integrate maps into our apps, which again adds a whole new level of power and functionality to our apps. See you then.